the actual deferred funding is the month of December, but we're very proud you're with us celebrating this uh, Advent season uh, today at the church. We have a lot of announcements we would love to share with you. Some of them will make it through and some will, will not cover everything today. There's just a, well, the decorations, I hope you see them. Make note and take a little look at what's around you. Several people made these possible and worked very hard. Uh, Leanne Stockton, uh, Greta Weatherhood, uh, Dale and Peggy Leslie, uh, James Marlin, uh, Kathy Needs, and Kim Hogan had to pick up the flowers that you see right there uh, that they displayed uh, are on display for you. So appreciate these people, and if anyone else helped, we appreciate your efforts also. Notice the poinsettias that are given in memory and in honor of the uh, insert in the bulletin. That's there for you. Notice this also. This is a good opportunity to mention this. This is the first uh, Sunday of the month of, of December. These are stewardship uh, 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 giving, stewardship reports that uh, are asked of you if you would like to participate. This is actually faith giving cards for 2020. And all you have to rock through is the 20. And you can prepare this. 21, uh, your uh, pledge or your gift that you'd like to make to the church for next year. Uh, it's desperately needed and, and because of the situation the church is in and all churches are in, even as we speak. Thank you for your support in that area and all the areas. Today we'll be receiving uh, uh, our only uh, uh, confirmee from our confirmation class that started back in late February, early March of this year. We're, we're ending it up today. Lillian Dunn will be receiving the church and baptized this morning, so remember her and her family as well. There's a uh, food pantry meeting. I understand still a scheduled meeting immediately following the worship service. The bullet, it's in, information is in the bulletin right there, Christian Life Center. Advent calendars, they're out in the narthex of the church. Please take one. And, and, and use it during the season of Advent. There's a devotion for every every day during the season. Wednesday activities, a lot of these have been discontinued through the month of the rest of the month. So I would say directly be in touch with your uh, teacher and the person that's leading the uh, uh, small groups. I know the children and, and youth are not going to be meeting the rest of this month. So uh, uh, keep them in mind as well. We will have a virtual Christmas program that will be uh, presented pretty soon. So we want you to be in tune for that. We'll be making that announcement. Uh, the Heaven Sunday School class still collecting uh, used uh, duffel bags for the children of the foster care mission here in Etiwamba County. The uh, Information pertaining to worship. Worship. This is something that you need to know and people have asked questions about and shut down and what we're going to do. Unless we hear something really drastically different from our Methodist conference here in Mississippi, from our bishop, our plans next Sunday, next Sunday for worship, is to do just like we're doing this morning. We're going to be uh, filming this. We're going to have it. It'll, it'll be on YouTube. It'll be on the website. And uh, we would uh, uh, ask you to participate, to, to enjoy it that way, if you will. But if you want to come like you are right now and sit with us during the filming of next Sunday's uh, uh, broadcast, we want you to be with us. And I don't really know many ways to say that. We just want you to practice safe distancing, wear your mask, do the things that you know to do. And we're going to be filming next Sunday morning at 1025, just like we are this morning. And if you want to come be with us just like you are this morning, we want you to. We want you to. Uh, as a matter of fact, this needs to be said. I don't know if we'll ever recover and I, as a nation, as a people, and as a church from what COVID virus has done to us as a people and how attendance is becoming it, a church. Several people this morning have made this statement to me. It's very interesting. That staying at home watching online is very good and we appreciate it very much. But you can get used to that and so used to it that even church attendance is, uh, is something maybe you'd rather not do, just watch it online. 
And that's okay. We appreciate you being with us that way. There's nothing like being with us in person. So next Sunday, we have things scheduled this month. We have baptism this morning, infant baptism next Sunday. These are vital uh, parts of, of ministry and of, of the Christian uh, uh, church. So we want to continue with our mission as much as we possibly can. If you, if, you want to, if you find out something different or if we find out something different, we'll let you know as soon as possible. The website or Facebook. All right. Thank you. God is good and all the time. God is good. And this is the second Sunday in the wonderful season of Advent. Let's pray a call that. Mighty God, you've made us in all things to serve you. Now ready the world for your rule. Come quickly to save us so that violence and crime shall end and your children shall live in peace, honoring each other with justice and love. Through Jesus Christ, who lives in power with you and with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And let his church say, Amen. Please stand for the hymn of celebration, number 220 of the Methodist Temple, Angels from the Earth.
Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Power, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We thank you for this morning and the lighting of the Advent wreath and all the wonderful things that our children do for us. God bless them. In your name we pray. Amen.
Jesus taught his church to pray, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Our scripture this morning is from Isaiah, the 40th chapter, and it's a very interesting passage of scripture. It is probably one of the most quoted passages of scripture in the Bible. It's wonderful to learn something anew about the Bible all the time, isn't it? And every time we actually endeavor to study the scriptures, you're invariably going to learn them always do. I do. This is a magnificent passage of scripture uh, from the uh, and words of Isaiah inspired by God prophesying something new that is to come on the scene. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And uh, it, there's, here's a little few side notes well, before we read the scripture. There's a commercial on television about uh, Holocaust uh, survivors that uh, are living in Europe that are hungry, that are starving. People are making, sending food to them. You've probably seen the commercial if, 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 on television. Well, at the beginning of that commercial, they start with this text we're about to read to you. They start with this comfort, comfort, oh my people, says your Lord. It's the, uh, I, I, and I noticed that the other day when I just saw this, this uh, commercial. Isaiah is very, very special. Now, Isaiah, the Old Testament book, is about like the whole Bible in miniature. Really. I'm not going to say one book of the Bible is more important than the other one, but it is very, very special. Isaiah is separated. For, for, for instance, there are 66 books in the Bible, Old and New Testament. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah. The Bible is separated into two halves, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Isaiah is separated into two halves. Really, the first 39 verses, or first 39 chapters of Isaiah deal with the, uh, it's kind of like an Old Testament passage dealing with judgment and the present threat that was the Assyrians that Isaiah and the children of Israel were facing. From verses from chapter 40 on through 66, the rest of it, kind of the New Testament part of Isaiah, where, where we have all these prophetic statements pertaining to the coming of the Messiah. This is the redemption passages dealing with Isaiah. In the uh, Babylonian threat is being dealt with. The part of the scripture we're about to, about to read this morning is, are the words that John the Baptist uses as the forerunner for Christ. It's interesting how John the Baptist uses the Old Testament words of Isaiah to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus, the New Testament, but yet 
John the Baptist quotes this passage we're about to read to you in the, in the, in the Gospels. It's recorded in all four of the Gospels, actually. As a matter of fact, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, from chapters 40 through 66, is repeated about 65 times, or referred to about 65 times in the New Testament. The point is, the point is, the New Testament certainly does utilize Isaiah. And, and, and I can see why you can too, because this is lectionary scripture for today. It's about the coming of the Messiah. God's people are comforted, should be comforted. So hear the word of God. And uh, this is very special. Comfort, oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term and that her penalty is paid. That's very powerful language. Her penalty is paid for her sins. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. A voice cries out, and this is quoted by John the Baptist, and it, 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 it's just so I have an Old Testament teacher in seminary that this was his favorite passage of Scripture. When he read this Scripture, word I'm about to read to you, it was as though a halo was over his head and a light beamed down from heaven because he really loved this passage. And it's, it's so significant and, and special. And these are the words of Isaiah but prophesying the coming of the Messiah. A voice cries out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries out, and I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. And the grass symbol here is something that's not around very long. Grass is just here seasonally. It doesn't last very long. All people are grass. And their countenance is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades with the breath of the Lord blows upon them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Did you hear that? That's very significant. That's very important. Regardless of what happens on the scene, the world stage, whatever happens, whatever happens with me, whatever happens with you, whatever happens with COVID-19, whatever happens, the word of the Lord will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift up, do not fear, says the cities of Judea. Here is your God. See, the Lord is coming with might, and his arm, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd and will gather the lambs in his arms and he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother's sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. People are amusing, to say the least, correct? If you're a people watcher, and I'm sure you are, because you're one of us, sometimes we act silly, sometimes we act funny, Sometimes we're very sad. Sometimes we're very happy. I noticed in my own notes and my history of what I preach over the years and 40 plus years of ministry that I've used this text a few times along the way. And at this part of the message, I usually refer to how things were or even how things are. And I remember dealing with this text in the past talking about how desperate the situation is in Bosnia. 
Central America, South America, the Middle East in years past. These are the, these are the, the hotbeds of problems in the world. Israel, Jordan, Coptic Christians being beheaded in Jew, um, Egypt. All of these things were problems in the world. Then 2020 comes along, lectionary scripture for the second Sunday of Advent, right here. And I think of the problems that we're facing now in the world. It's very interesting that the problems I see now as a minister observing, just like you do, they're in areas and places like Seattle, Portland this year. Minneapolis, Washington, D.C., Chicago, New York City, St. Louis, Los Angeles, San Francisco, on and on and on. Serious problems. And the big difference between yesterday, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, dealing with this text, is most of those problems I mentioned were foreign-related problems. The difference today is they're at home. They're at home. They're right here with us. All the problems that we see laid out on the screen before us in the news. And many of us have even stopped watching the news. A good, a good example of what's happening in our culture was depicted in Los Angeles recently. A homeless man, it's true, it's on, I guess it's true, it's on the news was given an airline ticket to anywhere he wanted to go in the United States, continent of the United States. It would be a one-way ticket. He was given a free airline ticket to any place he wanted to go in this country. A homeless man. They went to get him out of town. So he said, show me a map. And they brought him a map. And he looked over the map, and he looked over the map and carefully examined everything on the map. And then he came back to the people that were offering him this ticket and says, do you have another map? Because there's not any place here I want to go. To me, that kind of sums the whole thing up, kind of, in a way, because we're all in this together. And is one place really any better than the other? We might think so. We might not think so. But how that guy feels is kind of like the way we all feel. God says, comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her turn and that her penalty is paid and she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. We do need a word of comfort, don't we? This Advent season, this year, even though this country is still the envy of the world, and it is, I have to brag on this nation, there's still people that leave Cuba in rickety boats and try to make their way across the strait to get to southern Florida. Just because we have a constitution, just because we do have freedom, and there is security in this nation. We're proud of it. But in the midst of all of those wonderful assets we can tout and be proud of, there's still, we're, we're troubled, aren't we? We're troubled, if you're my age, about what's going to be down the road for retirement. What's going to be there? Is anything going to be there? All the problems that we're dealing with, the, the being victims of crime, being victims of, of pa pandemics, Layoffs and family problems, health-related problems, aging, and more. And before I get off of that subject, let me just say this. Now, be careful if we, if we, as 2020 is coming to a conclusion, and we're going to start 2021, and all of us are optimistic for 2021, be careful. Don't ever say it can't get any worse. Because life has taught us some powerful lessons, has it? The first word of comfort is forgiveness. This is what Isaiah is conveying 
inspired by the Spirit of the Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. Her penalty has been paid. Think about that. Do you feel that your penalty has been paid? Today is our, our last day for our confirmation class of all the, it's taken just about all year long to make our way through it because of COVID and, and, and we couldn't meet different times. But one of the things that we always share with the people in confirmation classes, even though they're pretty young, I always ask them, do you realize and understand that your sins are forgiven? And why your sins are forgiven? These are young people. They're not immoral people. But we need to understand why Jesus goes to the cross and why he dies for us. And we accept that fact. We accept the fact that Jesus has saved our immortal souls. We have received forgiveness. That's a powerful thing. This is Isaiah is saying this. The penalty has been paid. And Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice and Savior for humanity's sake. There was a story that comes to us from Little Rock. Oh, a few years ago, this 13-year-old uh, this boy's mother was on chemotherapy, and she lost her hair. So this 13-year-old boy, trying to be supportive of his mother, shaves his head because he wants to be supportive of his mother. And everything sounds pretty noble and good, doesn't it? Until the young man goes to school, public school. And when he goes to public school, Lord, is he harassed. He's made fun of, even by teachers. He's called a skinhead. He's called a neo-Nazi. He's called a fascist. He's called everything in the world. And he really, in his heart, he doesn't feel he has to explain to them why he shaved his head. It got so severe that a group of them literally beat him up. The principal had to intervene and have a special assembly explain to the student body why a young boy, 13 years old, shaves his head. But you know what? It, that didn't make much of a difference with some of the people that were still picking on him and, and, and touting him. Now, there's something about that illustration I just sh shared with you. There's a deeper, deeper meaning to this than just something superficial and something that happens to a boy that's 13 years old with his mother. The deeper meaning is this, someone else has gone before us and shown solidarity with us. Someone else has taken a beating for us and spit on for us, crucified for us. That's why the first word of comfort that we need to share is forgiveness. Forgiveness. You have been forgiven. Do you feel forgiven? I hope you do. You should. You've been forgiven. He took it upon himself. And that's the and the result is what Isaiah is prophesying and saying here. He's paid the penalty. The penalty has been paid for us. The Messiah does. The first word is comfort. The second word of comfort here uh, 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 is presence. In verse 3, we read that a voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. One of the reasons Virgil Todd, an Old Testament professor, loved this scripture so much is that he compared this text to the, uh, to, to the oriental mindset. It's hard for Isaiah not to be influenced by the Assyrians, and the Babylonians and all of these people were much further east, the far east even, than Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center of the world almost in antiquity. People from southern Europe, we wouldn't even call Europe then, would come down through caravans to Africa and back and forth. And people from the far east would come through selling their merchandise, their silk and whatever. Jerusalem was a center. It was just a center of, 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 of all kinds of trade and activity. Isaiah was influenced so much by the Oriental world, uh, Virgil Todd would say, the Old Testament professor, that when you think of an ancient emperor in the Orient or China 
going through a province, going through an area, going through a town, going through a city, the poor peasants would have to get out and clear the way for the king coming through. They, I mean, they did this up until the last hundred years in the Orient. I mean, if the emperor is going to come through, the emperor doesn't even touch the ground in the Oriental world. Someone is there for him to step on. He doesn't even touch the ground. And if he's coming through, the, 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 the peasants go out and pick up the pebbles in the road. If the road is crooked, they straighten it out. If the road is hilly, they cut the hill down. If it needs filling in, they fill it in. Dr. Todd used to say it's hard to get away from that oriental influence when you read this text about the coming of the king, the Messiah. Hear the words again that we shared a few moments ago. Voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the uneven ground shall become level, the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all the people shall see it together in the mouth of the Lord. God has spoken. <laughs> That's magnificent scripture. That's magnificent scripture. It's about God's presence with us. And uh, I think about the young man that uh, had been off in war. It doesn't really matter what war, but he comes home Christmas Eve, late in the evening, he's been off in war for a couple of years. His little children are in bed, so they don't wake the children up. But the next morning, when the little children get up and go down to the Christmas tree to see their gifts, they see Daddy sitting in a chair. And those children automatically forget all the gifts under the tree. But what do they focus on? They focus on the presence of their dad being with them that had been absent for a couple of years of their life. He's come back from war. He's present with them. And when I think about that illustration, I think about the meaning of Advent. We talk a lot about presence, and we talk a lot about the presence of the Lord. God has come to us to bear our pain and our distress in our time of need and blesses us. God is present. And the same thing occurs day in, day out in our lives. The uncertainty of what's going to happen as 2021 is in store for us. Uh, home, health, sickness. There was a story that we read as a, I think, junior high school student, Silas Martin. And there was an incident where the father image has to help the child across the ravine, a terrible ravine, a deep chasm. And, and, and the father image says to the child, stay there, I'll come hold your hand across the way. And, and that's kind of the image we have of Advent. And I, that's the image we need to have of Christ being there with us. We don't know what 2021 has in store for us. Hopefully it will be better. I'm optimistic. I want to always see the glass half full. But one of my drawbacks is I've always been a realist as well. A realist. There's an incident with Ludwig von Beethoven. One of his friends, the child died in the family. And this happened late in Beethoven's life. And he had difficulty communicating with people. But Beethoven wanted to visit his friend. So the night of visitation, he goes to his friend's house. And, and Beethoven had a hard time communicating at this time in his life because he was deaf. He either talked too loud or he talked too soft. No one heard him. He was deaf. And he had a difficult time communicating. So when he walks in, he sees a piano over in the corner. And he says to the uh, person that had lost their child, do you mind if I play the piano for a while? So Ludwig von Beethoven sits down at the piano and for the next 30 minutes to an hour plays some of the softest, most beautiful music ever. And the father said after he left, that was the greatest visit anyone had made, the most comforting visit. So when we talk about the presence of the Lord today on Advent, this uh, season, which means the most in our lives? Presence? As in gifts, that would be P R E S E N T S, present. Or 
presence, as in someone to be there for us, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E. Hmm. Which one means the most? Now, as a child, I understand children. You do too, don't you? They focus on those, those gifts and presents, and that's, that's okay. But there's a passage of Scripture that says when you're a child, you act like a child. When you're an adult, you put away childish things. We know what presence means to us today, don't we? Hopefully on this second Sunday of the season of Advent and the presence of the Lord. The other word for today is love. When I read verse 11 in this text, I'm reminded that Isaiah must have been familiar with the psalm. The Psalms during the time of Isaiah were there. They circulated. They might not have been all together in a book called the Book of the Psalms, but they floated around. They were in existence. And I'm sure Isaiah was familiar with the 23rd Psalm. When we, about the Lord is my shepherd. When we read verse 11, we, we read, He will feed his flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs in his arms. What a word of love. What a word of comfort. This is the reason for the season. It's forgiveness and God's presence and love. That's why even the unbelieving world, yes, even the unbelievers in the world enjoy Christmas. Now, I've often wondered how hypocritical that is. Maybe you have as well. But even unbelievers rally around Christmas and enjoy it. I think about my mother-in-law sometimes. This time of the year, she, she was very she she was the director of Penn State Opportunity over on the east, uh, western part of the state for years. She had a whole staff of people working with her and under her. One Christmas year, or one year at Thanksgiving, who she was talking at, at Thanksgiving lunch, and she said, "You know, I've got a couple of workers that do not believe in Christmas. They're a member of a certain group. I call them a cult." But they're a member of a certain group that do not believe in Christmas. They do not recognize Christmas. And she jokingly said, maybe. That, I mean, they won't participate. They won't draw names. They won't uh, come to any Christmas uh, party or celebration that they had at work. She jokingly said, maybe I ought to withhold their Christmas bonus. Maybe I ought to withhold their Christmas gift since they don't believe it. Well, Thanksgiving goes by, and at Christmas, I remember asking Helen, I said, what did you do with those two employees? Did you give them their Christmas gifts? She, she laughed, and she said, yes. She gave them their Christmas bonus, and certainly they wouldn't turn it down. Of course not, even though they didn't believe in Christmas, didn't want Christmas, but yet the critical nature is to grab when you could, of course. And she, she was afraid not to offer it to them. She could have been sued, possibly. I don't know. Who can resist the outpouring of God's love? I've seen even unbelievers moved and touched by the Word of God. I think when you understand presence and how much more the presence, the individual presence of God and the presence of each other means, thankfully, I think most of you will agree with me. We've already had a Christmas, haven't we? We don't have to have something to open up Christmas morning because we have it 365 days a year. It's Christmas. And it really is about heaven. You know, I, I resist sometimes the uh, reward type theology, punishment type theology, a Christian because you don't want to go to hell. And, and, I, and there may be something very well to that. It may be important to some people. But there is such a thing as a reward. As a matter of fact, that's part of the scripture we just read about the reward. Let's do it again. See, the Lord is coming with his might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him. That's verse 10. It is really about heaven, isn't it? The world is very distracted. When we think about the, all the names and things that I mentioned earlier about all these cities in this country, 
all the riots and all the problems. We think about the pandemics. I prob we probably have not seen the end of pandemics in your lifetime. That's a reality. The world is distracting us. Satan is really at work. Keeping people away from God, God's cause, even Satan has used the COVID-19 virus effectively. The world is distracting. And it's distracting us from the big picture. The big thing. And the big thing is that Christ has come. Christ is here. And if you're a New Testament believer, you believe that Christ is coming again. It's not something to be feared. Something to be to glory in, to be, to be comforted by. Because the same Christ who was born of Mary will come back as the, the second coming. And the, we might be in the midst of that advent even as we speak. As we're celebrating this advent, second candle was lit today. Second Sunday. We could be in the midst of the second advent. Another word that's been very popular in the last few years is the word gravitas. Have you heard that term? You've probably heard it, maybe used it a lot. Gravitas. I haven't used it much. Don't think much of it, but I looked the definition of it. What does it mean? Gravitas means dignity and seriousness of manner. That's nice. Dignity and seriousness of manner. A person with gravitas. How many people do you know with gravitas? Well, I'll tell you one thing for sure. This scripture is full of gravitas that we've shared with you from Isaiah, the 40th chapter. It's full of dignity. It's full of seriousness. It's a directive from the Old Testament that is about as contemporary as today's newspaper. It's about comfort and comfort my people, says your God. Jesus is the comforter in the midst of whatever. And Christ will be on the throne regardless and forever. And I want to be with him, don't you? Let's have our closing and invitational hymn, you know, I believe. We're going to sing one verse. We'll give instructions on, and we'll have one verse, and this will be our invitation. Please stand for the hymn of invitation.
opening paragraph on page 45 of the baptism service. If anyone ever asks you what the church is, you want a definition of the church, if you're ever in a class somewhere and they want to know what the church is, the definition of it, here's a paragraph. This is the perfect definition of the church, right here on page 45 in the baptismal covenant 3. It says, the church is of God and will be preserved to the end of time for the conduct of worship, the due administration of God's word and sacraments. And this is what we're doing this morning, the sacraments. The maintenance of Christian fellowship and discipline. The edification of believers and the conversion of the world. All, A-L-L, -L, all, of every age and station stand in need of the means of grace which it alone supplies. Now that's a perfect definition of the church. It's from the Book of Common Prayer. Perfect. For as much as all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, our Savior, Christ said, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, one cannot enter the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we call upon thee, thee for these thy, ser thy servant, that she, coming to holy baptism, may receive remission for her sins, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and receive her, O Lord, as thou hast promised by thy well-beloved Son, and grant that she may be faithful to thee all the days of her life and finally come to the eternal kingdom which thou hast promised through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, we'll admit that first statement and I'll ask you questions here. You'll respond, okay? Do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins? I do. I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? I do. Do you promise according to the grace given you to keep God's holy will and commandments all and walk in the same all the days of your life as a faithful member of Christ's holy church? Now, come over here, Lily, if you will. Do you desire to be baptized in this faith? I do. Okay, come a little closer, if you will. Lily and Don, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lily and the Lord within you with his heavenly grace, and by his Spirit confirm you as a faithful in, uh, in, in the faith and fellowship of true disciples of Jesus Christ. This is an invitation now to you. You may be a member of other uh, churches, other denominations. So this is your invitation this morning. Let those persons who are members of other communions of Christ's holy church and who now desire to enter into the fellowship of this congregation present themselves to be received into the membership of the United Methodist Church. Anyone would like to transfer their letter? Lydia, here's a question. Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your services? I will. I will. Now, here's an invitation to Methodists. If you've already joined the Methodist Church but would like to transfer it to this one, here's your invitation. Let those who are members of other congregations of the United Methodist Church who now desire to enter into the fellowship of this congregation present themselves to be welcome. Anyone who wants to transfer? Okay. We'll ask you to respond in a moment. Brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care, Lily and Don, whom we this day receive into the membership of this congregation. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. Will you respond? We, we rejoice to recognize you, member of Christ's church. 